fortification from this lecture onwards. So I will not always be the person from now on who is taking questions. We may have different volunteers for every lecture. So today for uh, Professor Bhattacharya's current and next lecture, we have Yash Bharga, who is a student at Ayuka. And what we have done is on the Wiki page, the PB Works web page, if you go and refresh the page, you will now see next to the Zoom link column, there is a column called Q&A host. And we will list the name of the person who will be hosting the question answer session there. So for example, all the lectures that I did, my name is there, Yash's name is there for Vipankar's remaining lectures. And in some cases, the lecturer themselves will be taking questions. So for example, for Professor Ranjan Gupta's lecture, he will be handling questions. So the name will be listed accordingly. So you can please check that web page uh, as and when it is updated. Uh, and uh, we will inform you in case there is any change in the way we are taking questions. Okay, so for the time being, for today's lecture, we are taking questions in the same way as we have been doing, except that Yash will be taking the questions instead of me. So we are at 11.30. Uh, we can start uh, streaming and recording. Uh, and Dipankar, you can take over. Thank you, Asim. So let's get started with the third lecture. Welcome. So, um, so far, we have uh, looked at how a single charge radiates when uh, it is accelerated. We know uh, how to uh, compute the power it radiates through Lamar formula. And we have also seen that when radiation propagates through matter, how um, the role of optical depth defines the shape of the spectrum, which um, we finally see. So now, uh, today let us begin with specific radiation processes, which uh, are of interest in astronomy. So <clears throat> the first uh, process that uh, I'm going to uh, talk about is called uh, Bremsstrahlung or uh, free free uh, emission. So where you have an ionized plasma and you have protons and electrons. And when an electron passes by a proton, the Coulomb field of the proton will accelerate the electron. And this acceleration will cause the electron to radiate. So, so this radiation is normally known as Bremsstrahlung. And since the electron is not bound to the proton, either before or after this encounter. In, in, uh, in astronomy, we also refer to this as free free emission. So what kind of uh, radiation spectrum shall we expect from such an encounter? So as you can see, as the electron approaches the proton, you will have an acceleration which is along the line joining the electron and the proton. The electron has its own velocity to start with and the direction of the velocity, the initiation of the initial velocity, the perpendicular distance between that vector and the position of the proton is called the impact parameter B. So the electron is going that way and because of the interaction, the trajectory may now curve. So uh, at any given point of time, there is a component of uh, acceleration which is parallel to the velocity of the electron. And there is a component of uh, acceleration which is perpendicular to the velocity. And uh, the uh, total acceleration is uh, the the squared addition of these two components, the total acceleration squared is the squared addition of these two components. And that's, that's what we need in the Lamar formula. So at any given instant of time, we can now write the Lamar formula with acceleration squared as the A parallel squared plus A perpendicular squared. And as the electron passes by, both these quantities change. 
because the distance between the electron and the proton is changing and also the apparent angle between the you know, current mo motion of the electron and the vector joining the electron and the proton is changing. So uh, that time dependence of the acceleration will cause a time dependence of the electric field that is radiated. And that uh, time dependent electric field, once we uh, look at the time dependence of it and take a Fourier transform, we will get the spectrum of this radiation. Now, I'm not going to go through the derivation of it. I'm going to show you some results. So the Fourier transform of the electric field, uh, which is obtained this way, has, these, has this expression where in the square bracket, there are two terms. The first term comes from the you know, parallel component of acceleration, which is the acceleration parallel to the you know, you know, velocity. And this is perpendicular component of the acceleration, it's acceleration perpendicular to velocity. And this multiplied by all this will be uh, called a term I2. And this multiplied by this is, uh, will be called the term I1. Now, what is outside is the charge of the ion, the electron charge, the charge number of the ion is the electron charge, then there's a constants, then electron mass squared, one over square of the velocity of the electron. This is the Lorentz factor of the electron squared. And this is again, the square of the velocity. And this is the frequency at which we are evaluating the in the radiation, in the intensity of the radiation. So I of omega is a function of omega, and this is the dependence. These functions k0 and k1 with the argument omega b over gamma b are modified Bessel functions. We can look at the asymptotic <coughs> behavior of these functions. Both these functions at a large value of the argument has a exponential cutoff. So this is K0 or K1 with an argument Y for large value of Y has a form pi by two Y to the half e to the power of minus Y. So therefore the contribution of these functions for <coughs> arguments in the large compared to one is very small. So the most of the contribution to the spectrum comes at uh, the argument less than one. And then argument, as you can see, is omega b by gamma v. Now, uh, let's, uh, for uh, illustration, consider uh, non-relativistic motion where gamma is equal to one. Then the, for the impact parameter b and the electron speed v, the typical interaction time of the electron with the proton is uh, the time scale is B over V. The frequency corresponding to that is V over B. So omega as, uh, less than that uh, characteristic frequency will have significant con contribution, but omega much larger than that characteristic frequency, the characteristic frequency being uh, V over B will have very little contribution. So uh, the interaction time, inverse of the interaction time, uh, acts as the uh, typical uh, characteristic frequency in the problem. And uh, once the uh, motion is relativistic, then uh, that frequency can be uh, Lorentz boosted by this factor gamma. So this becomes b over gamma v rather than b over v. So uh, this quantity, uh, now we can look at uh, what the behavior is at uh, small values of uh, uh, the argument, because that's where it will be most important. For this uh, function k0 at uh, y much less than one, this again drops off. And now I have uh, plotted the uh, two functions, I2 and I1 over here. So as you can see, this is the characteristic frequency 
and the function k zero multiplied by all this drops off on both sides of uh, the characteristic, uh, characteristic uh, frequency, and this quantity has a um, low um, low argument asymptotic as one over y. And now we can see this is k one squared, so this will be um, one by y squared. So this will be excuse me um, gamma squared v squared by omega squared v squared. Now you take that out. Gamma squared v squared will cancel. Omega squared will cancel. You will get one by b squared, and that is a constant as a function of omega. So this quantity, z squared e six to twenty four pi to the power of four epsilon cube c c cube, m squared v squared b squared, is a characteristic intensity. Let's call that i zero, and you know, the main contribution. From all these terms put together, will be this constant uh, intensity at uh, frequencies less than uh, gamma v over b. So <clears throat> all these other uh, effects we can now neglect, and then we can say that the primary contribution to the spectrum is basically a constant spectrum for a given charge. With a given velocity and with a given uh, uh, impact parameter. Now, <clears throat> the net observed spectrum from the source will be the sum of the spectra of all emitting particles. So, uh, now let's look at all the particles with the same uh, speed v, but they will have different uh, impact parameters. So, once you change the impact parameter, then you know, the intensity of the spectrum will change. So you know, the first thing we can do is, for a given v, I can integrate this expression over the distribution of impact parameters. So distribution of impact parameters is simply twice pi b dB. So you know, and you know, the number of particles which will pass through you know, you know, such an impact parameter at you know, you know, over unit time is the number density n. Which is Lorentz boosted by factor gamma, so gamma n times v, the uh, uh, the velocity that gives you the flux of these particles, and twice pi b uh, dB is the area. So that gives you the total number of encounters per second of uh, 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 particles with velocity v, electrons with velocity v, and that gives you then uh, now uh, for i, I substitute i zero and integrate this. So this then gives me the in, uh, intensity due to all encounters of a single electron with velocity v. So all the possible uh, uh, impact parameters have been taken into account. So this uh, result now has one by v in the denominator, and log of b min prime and uh, b max prime by b min prime. So log of b max by b min uh, as a multiplier. So uh, we have to choose what. In, uh, our b max or the typical b max or typical b min should be so typical b max uh, would be such that if you are looking at uh, frequency omega the, your b should be such that uh, for that given velocity the characteristic frequency should be above that omega so uh, that gives you a, a ballpark estimate of b max and Uh, b min uh, one normally uses the uh, uh, de broglie wavelength of the particle so that is h by uh, mev uh, as the uh, minimum impact parameter so that gives you a uh, typical ratio over here which has a mild dependence on omega And we will uh, uh, sort of lump that uh, dependence, logarithmic dependence on omega later into a factor, which we'll uh, come to presently. And so uh, this now is a um, p factor, which is one by v in it. Now this is for a single velocity of uh, the uh, electron. So now uh, we have to integrate this 
over the velocity distribution. So this is a single particle emission. Now, when you're looking at you know, emission from a bunch of particles, we have to look at the energy distribution or velocity distribution of these particles. And let's look at thermal Bremsstrahlung, where the velocity distribution is given by Maxwellian, where any of V dV is proportional to V squared e to the power of minus half mv squared by kt. Now, we just have to multiply this with the expression that we had here and integrate over velocity. Keeping in mind one thing that uh, to produce a photon of energy h cross omega, the electron at least must have that much kinetic energy. So the limits of the integration should be such that for a given omega, we should be integrating from a lower limit of V, which is given by this condition. So having done so, then we can arrive at the emission per unit volume, I of omega, which will be given by these factors, where you can see this is, it has picked up this one by kT to the power of half. And the omega dependence is now, uh, expressed by a, a function g omega t. So g omega t is, uh, because of this exponential factor and the corresponding lower limit, which is uh, related to the frequency, uh, it um, converts itself into an exponential factor um, over here, which is e to the power of minus h cross omega by t, and a slowly varying function g f f r. So this GFF bar is called a uh, Gaunt factor, which has got a very slow dependence like a logarithmic dependence on frequency. So now um, uh, using this, we can then uh, uh, convert this to emission coefficient, so in, uh, epsilon nu FF. Epsilon nu is nothing but four pi J nu. So um, J nu is the emission coefficient uh, which we um, um, used in the radiative transfer equation, epsilon nu ff is the uh, integral over j nu ff for all solid angles. And but since this emission is isotropic, so for epsilon nu ff is just four pi j nu ff. And when you put in the numbers with uh, number density values in uh, centimeter cube you uh, get an expression which is um, proportional to uh, the square of the uh, ionic charge times number density of electrons times number density of ions times t to the power of minus half from here, uh, e to the power of minus h nu by kt from here, and the Gaunt factor. So much in ergs per second per in hertz per cubic centimeter. Now, um, uh, if you want to look at the total volumetric uh, emission coefficient, which means uh, integrate this over frequency, then uh, this e to the power of minus h nu by kt gets uh, integrated, and you get a, uh, t up there, which uh, cancels with t to the power of minus half and gives you t to the power of plus half. Now, the volumetric uh, emission coefficient is important in looking at, in, uh, in characterizing the uh, cooling rate of the of the gas. So if you have a certain amount of energy, it is this amount of energy that is being lost per unit time, per unit volume, uh, due to thermal Bremsstrahlung. So that is proportional to t to the power of half. So as you increase the temperature of the gas, the cooling rating increases. On the other hand, for a given frequency nu, the emission coefficient drops because the emission is now getting stretched over larger range of frequencies because H nu by kT of the order of one is up to the point up to which significant presence is there of the emission coefficient. Now, once you have got the emission coefficient and hence J nu, we can uh, immediately uh, compute the uh, absorption coefficient alpha nu. And uh, for this, since this is a thermal 
uh, emission, we can uh, use the fact that the source function must be Planck function, which is J nu by alpha nu is equal to B nu. So alpha nu is J nu by B nu. And uh, so uh, you can just take this and divide by B nu, which is uh, nu cubed divided by one minus e to the power minus H nu by KT. So once you divide by that, you pick up this nu to the power minus three and one minus e to the power minus H nu by KT in the numerator. So that gives you the uh, absorption coefficient. Uh, we'll be mostly interested in frequencies uh, less than KT because uh, beyond uh, H nu equal to KT, the uh, uh, emission coefficient drops dramatically anyway. So uh, in that regime, we can write this as one minus H nu by KT and then one cancels and this just becomes H nu by KT. And uh, so you get nu to the power minus two as the scaling of alpha nu FM. So which means as you go to lower and lower frequencies, the uh, absorption coefficient will go up. So for the same gas uh, at sufficiently low frequencies, the uh, material will be optically thick. Whereas at higher frequencies, the um, uh, absorption coefficient will drop and um, the optical depth tau nu can become less than one. So the um, uh, typical uh, spectrum, which we will get um, uh, from the thermal Bremsstrahlung is um, shown here. So the um, black body um, uh, at the temperature is shown in red which of course determines the upper envelope of the emission from this thermal gas. When at lower frequencies, the uh, material is optically thick, the uh, emission will be uh, the same as what is predicted by the uh, Planck function or the black body function. When it becomes optically thin, the uh, emission will be below the black body radiation curve and it will be given by the frequency dependence of the emission coefficient. And uh, as I said, the G nu has a very you know, slow logarithmic uh, inverse frequency dependence. So it, there will be a very slow drop. And then once you know, H nu becomes close to KT, you will begin to get a sharper drop at H nu greater than KT. You get an exponential drop, which is you know, which cuts off the spectrum. So a typical thermal Bremsstrahlung spectrum will look like this. Now, just to uh, compare the free-free absorption coefficient with the corresponding uh, uh, Thomson scattering coefficient, one can look at this number, it's 4.5 minus 25. And in case of th uh, Thomson scattering, it is 6.65 to the power minus 25 times any. This is times any times ni. So, uh, this is uh, roughly similar at uh, frequencies of the order of one megahertz and uh, with uh, KT of the order of one kV. Okay, so uh, here are some examples of uh, sources which uh, exhibit thermal free free em emission these are ionized hydrogen regions, and these are images you know, taken in uh, radio band. And this corresponds to uh, relatively low frequencies. And uh, so these are uh, typically located around here. The temperatures of these uh, these gases are of the order of about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. When you go to shock heated gas uh, created by fast moving supernova remnants, then you can get uh, the gas elevated to a very high temperature, tens of millions of degrees Kelvin. And the thermal brainstorming from that appears in X-ray wavelengths. And this is a X-ray image of a supernova remnant 3C10, uh, uh, the supernova recorded by Tycho Brahe in the year 1572. And uh, so this is an X-ray image where we see the emission and most of this emission also uh, originates in thermal Bremsstrahlung. 
in very large objects like you know, clusters of galaxies also there is a presence of hot gas so this is a image of a colliding cluster of galaxies where two clusters or you know, galaxy clusters have collided and the gas that were there in those two clusters have you know, got energized in this collision and you know, become hot and you know, is emitting in uh, thermal bremsstrahlung and this you know, pink glow that is you know, you know, depicted in this uh, false color picture you know, is the x-ray emission which comes from this hot gas and this again is primarily thermal bremsstrahlung emission so thermal bremsstrahlung emission is quite ubiquitous and uh, it is seen in many many regions in in the in the cosmic setting now we are talking about you know, hot gas where you see this you know, thermal bremsstrahlung emission let's say you know, 10 million degree gas there are other attendant you know, emission processes which also contribute to the emission from such gases now, we talked about free free emission that is the electron and the proton is in free state to start with and, and is in free state after the you know, radiation has occurred but you can also have free bound emission that a free electron you know, can radiate some energy and get captured in a bound orbit by a proton so you will get a, a hydrogen atom you know, maybe at an excited level and that you know, transition you know, since the original electron was in a continuum state also produces a continuum radiation except at the end of the radiation the electron is no longer free but it is bound in that so such radiations are called you know, recombination radiation or free bound radiation now here is an example of you know, the relative importance of such radiation from a typical uh, astrophysical plasma which has uh, hydrogen helium and other other heavy elements in the ratio uh, as seen in the solar neighborhood and if you uh, heat this gas to uh, 10 million degrees kelvin then you can see the uh, dominant emission mechanism is the thermal bremsstrahlung particularly at uh, relatively low frequencies and then uh, there is a substantial emission also added from free bound uh, radiation which is recombination radiation and they have these steps which correspond to recombination to different levels of the atom at uh, the highest end of the uh, energies uh, recombination radiation in fact um, contributes as much or more than the bremsstrahlung emission and then there is a third component which is also quite significant which adds to this and that's called a two photon continuum now once the uh, atom is being, uh, is created the uh, electron is captured by the proton and uh, you have an atom so then uh, this atom can make downward transitions the uh, electron can make downward transitions into uh, lower energy states in the atom and produce spectral lines and it's not only in hydrogen but also in other elements and these spectral lines will stand out like this as you can see here but in a higher order process the uh, transition between two discrete levels can pass through a, a virtual intermediate level which can be placed anywhere so the uh, transition from one level to another is accomplished by not just one photon but two photons and since this virtual level can now be anywhere between these two uh, two fixed bound levels the uh, radiation produced by this two photon uh, process is actually a continuum and this two photon continuum can also contribute substantially to the total emission as shown in this diagram and as you change the temperature the relative importance of these processes will change uh, but uh, we will not go into the details of that right now so these are the you know, different you know, emission processes that you know, occur in high temperature plasmas you know, you know, producing thermal emission so we will now go to some other mechanism so 
So we leave uh, Bram Stalling over there, and then we go to another very prominent uh, emission mechanism that we encounter in uh, astronomy, and those are radiation emitted by electrons in magnetic fields. Magnetic fields are quite common in all regions in, ast in uh, astronomical setting, and in, uh, if you have a electron in a pre-existing magnetic field, then the electron will execute a helical motion in this magnetic field. And because of this helical motion, you can clearly see that the electron experiences um, acceleration and that acceleration will cause the electron to radiate. If it is a slowly moving electron, injected perpendicular to a magnetic field, then the electron will execute a circular motion of a frequency. And in, uh, this circular motion uh, at a fixed frequency is in, uh, has the, in the cyclotron frequency, which is uh, given by uh, omega equal to the electron charge times the magnetic field divided by mass of the electrons times speed of light. So, uh, so EB over MC in CGS is the uh, uh, angular frequency of the circular motion that the electron will uh, execute. And if that is uh, the motion that you have, and the electron is moving very, very slowly. So there is no uh, relativistic correction to be made. Then the radiation that will be emitted by this will actually be a sharp uh, uh, spectral line at the cyclotron frequency. So you get a monochromatic radiation at uh, omega equal to omega, uh, uh, omega cyclotron which is EB over MC. However, now if you start adding the effects of the motion of the electron uh, and the uh, relativistic effects uh, associated with it, so you will get aberration, you will get uh, beaming, which I uh, alluded to already in the first lecture. And uh, if there is an angle of the elect electron's velocity vector with respect to the magnetic field, then <coughs> instead of just having a circle, you will also have the motion along the magnetic field. So, and there will be a uh, Lorentz factor associated with that too. So uh, all together, you will have a uh, asymmetric radiation pattern coming out of the electron. And as this radiation pattern moves across your line of sight, you will see a time-varying uh, time varying intensity. And uh, that therefore is not just uh, describable by a single sinusoid, but there is additional modulation. Although the fundamental frequency of radiation remains equal to the cyclotron frequency. So the uh, radiation will now be described by the um, fundamental at cyclotron frequency plus um, additional number of harmonics. And here is a um, uh, um, drawing of what you would expect if the velocity of the electron happens to be 40% of the speed of light, then you have the fundamental over here and you have all these other harmonics which add to the emission. And when you add it all up, the total emission will look like a continuum at high frequencies and then you will have these bumps at the lower frequencies. When you take this velocity much closer to the speed of light and you have a Lorentz factor, which is much, much larger than one, then these <coughs> harmonics will be spaced much more closer together and the entire emission will merge into a continuum. And such a process is called synchrotron radiation, where you have a relativistic electron in a magnetic field. So it just follows from the same cyclotron radiation pattern, but now you have in the orbit of the electron, 
the uh, radiation is beamed very tightly in the forward direction. So uh, within uh, emission cone of one over the Lorentz factor, one over gamma. And the electric field received by the observer as this electron passes by again and again in its orbit will look like this. It's a very sharp spike and then a lull for a long while and then again a very sharp spike as the beam passes by us. And <clears throat> the Fourier transform of this will now give us the spectrum and that spectrum will have an envelope which is given by this function, which is <clears throat> again, K five thirds is another modified uh, uh, Bessel function. This whole thing is called a McDonald function. So, uh, the general property of the function is that it has a peak at a frequency uh, omega critical, which is gamma cubed times the gyration frequency omega h times sine alpha. And the gyration frequency when uh, gamma is uh, large compared to one is no longer EB over MC, but uh, the uh, mass you have to replace by the uh, Lorentz boosted mass of gamma M. So it becomes EB over gamma MC. So the gyration frequency is down by a factor of gamma compared to the cyclotron frequency. But the cyclotron frequency is something which is independent of Lorentz factor. And this is cyclotron frequency by gamma. So therefore, this you know, factor omega C is in fact gamma squared times a constant. But the constant depends on the magnetic field. So the peak frequency, which is uh, equal to 0 0.29 times this value, so 0 0.29 times omega c by twice phi, this can be written as 0 0.81 gamma squared for uh, magnetic field of one, in one gauss, excuse me, z times, uh, z is the ionic charge, it's me over m times uh, so many megahertz. So ZME is the uh, charge of the particle which is emitting this radiation. With the electron, then Z is one, and you just have ME over M. So now, uh, the power radiated by a synchrotron process can be uh, uh, summarized in this neat expression, which is four third times uh, Thomson cross section sigma t times uh, speed of light c times velocity of the uh, particle in units of speed of light beta squared. So beta is almost equal to one for relativistic particles. Gamma squared times the energy density in the magnetic field. So this is b squared by h pi times m <coughs> over m squared. So if the uh, charge particle has uh, mass uh, equal to uh, electron mass, so if m is equal to me and z is equal to one, so this whole factor is one. So this uh, comes out to be so many arcs per second per particle. What one should note from here is that the Frequency, the characteristic frequency of the peak is proportional to the Lorentz factor squared. The amount of power radiated by the electron is also proportional to Lorentz factor squared. And this then uh, shapes the spectrum when we want to average this uh, single particle process over a distribution of energies. But before I do that, just show you some examples of synchrotron emitters. This is a supernova remnant, which I showed in my first lecture, this crab nebula, where there is a neutron star at the center acting as a pulsar and generating lots of 
uh, electron positron pairs uh, which are moving relativistically they emit in the local magnetic field and produce this synchrotron nebula the synchrotron nebula is seen both in uh, radio uh, as well as x rays very prominently and even in uh, optical you, know, you, you, you do see the uh, synchrotron glow but you also see the thermal emission from you know, heated filaments which are also present there but in both these cases radio and x rays what you see here is pure synchrotron emission here is synchrotron emission from some very large objects uh, these are radio galaxies and this is a galaxy called cygnus a where the galaxy itself is in, uh, at the center over here and from the center of the galaxy where there is a uh, supermassive black hole uh, which is accreting matter two powerful jets emanate and move to very very large distances and then uh, produce this uh, big plume of relativistic particles and magnetic field generating these radio lobes this is a radio image and all of this is synchrotron emission analogous to synchrotron emission there is another process which is also due to the motion of relativistic charged particles in curved trajectories the synchrotron radiation occurred because the charged particle moved in a curved trajectory around the magnetic field now uh, there could be cases where the magnetic field is so strong and the charged particles energy is limited so that the <coughs> the uh, charged particle is not able to move across the magnetic field at all but it can move along the magnetic field which can happen let us say there is a neutron star which is uh, which has a dipole magnetic field and there is a uh, electron which is produced which is uh, stuck to a magnetic field and it can produce uh, it can move only along the magnetic field but the magnetic field itself is not straight the dipole magnetic field is curved So as the charge moves along the curved field line, there is an acceleration associated with that too, and this motion also produces an emission which is very similar to synchrotron radiation. Except here, the radius of curvature of the orbit, which in case of synchrotron radiation was the radius of curvature of the circular motion around the field, is replaced by the radius of curvature of the field line itself. so it shares most properties of synchrotron radiation and you can replace normal radius with the radius of curvature of the field lines and you will get the you know, all the necessary properties of this radiation so there this is called curvature radiation this curvature radiation is very important in uh, the magnetosphere of you know, neutron stars uh, uh, for example pulsars the, most of the pulsar emission that we see is attributed to Uh, curvature radiation, which occurs due to a process like this. In case of synchrotron radiation, there is a uh, there is a <coughs> polarization of the of the emission, which uh, happens to be perpendicular to the projected magnetic field. In case of synchrotron radiation, in case of curvature radiation, the same uh, polarization will be. Uh, parallel to the projected field lines so you know, that is a um, distinguishing feature between the curvature radiation and the synchrotron radiation because the synchrotron radiation is coming from circular motion across the field line and you know, curvature radiation is due to cur uh, motion in a curved trajectory along the field line so you know, this is what i was talking about so you, you have charged particles moving along curved field lines and producing curvature emission they are highly relativistic so their emission is uh, directed in the uh, direction of the velocity which is you know, moving forward and as a result what you get from these you know, fast spinning neutron stars is emission that is very strongly beamed in a cone which is around the magnetic field axis 
and this is why they appear you know, pulsed to us as the radiation cone sweeps by as the neutron star rotates. Okay, so all of these processes, uh, either curvature emission or synchrotron emission, uh, have the property that the um, frequency is proportional to the square of the Lorentz factor and power is proportional to the square of the Lorentz factor. And um, um, to get the total emission from a bunch of particles, I now have to sum from uh, the emission from all the particles which have different values of gamma. So that means a different, uh, that's a uh, total energy distribution. Now, in general, where relativistic particles abound, the uh, method of creation of these relativistic particles often produces a spectrum of these particles, which is a power law. That is, you know, the number distribution is such that the number of particles at a given Lorentz factor gamma is proportional to Lorentz factor gamma to the power of minus some you know, power law index p here. So you know, if we take this as the you know, energy distribution and use these two information, the, you know, the characteristic frequency is proportional to gamma squared and the power emitted is proportional to gamma squared. Then the synchrotron emission uh, and the total emission from either synchrotron or curvature process uh, from this bunch of particles will have again a power law shape with a uh, slope in log intensity log frequency diagram as minus p minus one divided by two. So if this is minus p, this is minus p minus one by two. So that is the emission coefficient is new to the power of minus p minus one by two. Now this is non-thermal emission. There is a non-thermal distribution of particle energies. So in this case, the source function is no longer given by the uh, black, body, uh, black body curve. However, one can compute what the uh, absorption coefficient uh, looks like under these conditions. It turns out that the absorption coefficient looks like new to the power of minus p plus four by two. And therefore the source function here is proportional to new to the power of five halves, as opposed to uh, in a uh, case of you know, thermal sources at low frequencies where Rayleigh's law applies, S is proportional to nu squared. So here it is new to the power of two and a half. This is steeper than the you know, black body function at low frequencies. So if we take all this information and then uh, look at how the total emission from uh, such uh, the power law distribution of uh, uh, particles uh, will look like then uh, the net uh, energy spectrum is called spectral energy distribution over a very large band. Let us say all the going all the way from radio to gamma rays will look something like this. The uh, portion which we described, uh, which is p minus one by two, is the region where the uh, uh, N of gamma proportional to gamma to the power minus p applies. Now, as you go to higher and higher energies, the rate of loss of energy of per particle goes up because it's proportional to gamma squared. At very high energies, what will happen is, although you started with a power energy distribution which is proportional to gamma to the power minus p, because the rate of emission is high, rate of energy loss is high at higher energies, the spectrum will steepen, the energy spectrum will steepen. And if there's a continuous injection of particles with gamma to the minus p, uh, the steepened spectrum at uh, these higher energies, uh, where these tired electrons accumulate, uh, will have a slope which is minus p by two. So this is minus p minus one by two, and this is minus p by two. So it's 
spectrum steepens by half. Now at lower end, this uh, n of gamma proportional to gamma to the power minus p can continue only up to a, a certain lower limit. It cannot continue to zero because then you will have uh, infinite total energy of, uh, contained in the particle. So uh, there is a lower energy cutoff of gamma, let's say gamma min, and corresponding to the gamma min, also there is a synchrotron frequency. Below that synchrotron frequency, you will have a uh, uh, part of the spectrum, which will be like the uh, low energy tail of the spectrum of single particles emitting at uh, gamma min. And that has a slope of uh, one third in uh, log intensity log frequency diagram. As you go to even lower frequencies, at some point, uh, it will become optically thick. And you will get, in this case, to the power of plus two, just like the uh, black body emission. And that's because uh, for these particles here, uh, for this part of the emission, there is no uh, particle which has a synchrotron characteristic frequency lying at these frequencies. If the absorption happens to be within this uh, minus p minus one by two region, then you will see this. In the, S nu, which is proportional to uh, nu to the power of you know, five by two. So you'll have a you know, plus 2.5 slope of the absorbed spectrum. So uh, there's a difference whether the uh, absorption comes well below the low, low energy cutoff or above the low energy cutoff. That will give you two different slopes of the absorbed spectrum. And uh, the polarization of uh, synchrotron emission uh, is also a function of power law index. And uh, typically, the power law index seen in astronomical sources lie around this region, which is uh, around two, a little bit you know, distributed around two. So, which means you can get a polarization with a strictly ordered magnetic field uh, in this region around 65 to 70%. So of the order of 70% is the maximum polarization that you get from a synchrotron emission from a bunch of particles radiating in strictly ordered magnetic field. So I will stop there today and take questions. Okay, so uh, I have received a few questions. So uh, let's start with uh, Shatanik Bhattacharji. I'm unmuting you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So as you mentioned earlier that in Bramshaw Lung, we consider B min to be equal to the De Bruyne wavelength. H yes. by MeV. Yes. So, uh, but due to acceleration, the uh, speed must increase to some value, say V max. So, why don't we consider B min to be equal to H by MeV max? What is uh, V max? So this is the uh, typical uh, velocity of the particle, which is uh, you can con consider that the average velocity during this trajectory, right? But okay. uh, uh, yeah, so uh, this is this velocity scale that you are setting. So in, uh, the, there is, of course, in some a bit of a change in velocity because of the acceleration. But as you saw, the acceleration component parallel to the velocity is small. Acceleration component perpendicular to the velocity is much larger. And that's what contributes most of the radiation. So therefore, the magnitude of the velocity does not change all that much. But the direction changes mostly. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, next question is by Yashodan. I'm unmuting you. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask that uh, when we observe anything, we will get a 
range of intensity in various frequencies right yes so can we determine that for a given frequency uh, how much is contributed due to brain struggle or how much is contributed by some other effects can we uh, determine that by using some other means or can we not determine that oh no, this is uh, something that is routinely done i mean as i showed you that in a picture where i summed up the bremstrahlen then uh, um, uh, recombination emission then two photon emission what you actually observe is the total emission right so yes, let sir. me go back to that uh, slide right so it is the black line is what we are total what we are actually observing right so it has uh, all these processes you know, contributing to it as also in you know, a bound bound emission which gives you all these lines right now you know, to understand the spectrum we have to you know, create a model and the create a model of you know, physical properties of the plasma so the physical properties of the plasma has the density the temperature and you know, the abundance and at any given density and temperature you have a prediction for all these different processes right and uh, so then we we'll have to adjust our density temperature and abundance such that the total emission from all the processes put together uh, fit your observed emission right so uh, so indeed at any given frequency everything is contributing but uh, a priori you don't know uh, what is the proportion of that once you run this physical model and get a consistent picture over this entire frequency band uh, by adding all the predicted processes then uh, you know what is the uh, real breakup okay thank you sir uh next question is by arjun i'll unmute you good afternoon sir good afternoon Sir, my question is: How can we get to know about the asymptotic behavior of K one and K zero that you have mentioned in the first slide of today? The K one and K zero are defined as modified Bessel functions, right? So uh, I have not gone through the derivation of uh, uh, of the of this. Um, okay, sir. I'm getting some background uh, speech. Yeah. Uh, so uh, but uh, k0 and k1 are defined there is a algebraic full algebraic expression for k0 and k1 and uh, in that algebraic expression when i put the argument very large compared to one or very small compared to one i get this uh, i get these relations so i have not given you the full algebraic expression of k0 and k1 so uh, that comes from the full uh, mathematical definition of k0 and k1 the modified bessel functions now uh, I did not want to go into that detail in these lectures. Uh, okay. Uh, next few questions are uh, from people whose mics are not working, so I'll just read out the questions. Okay. Uh, this question is by Aparna. Uh, her question is that uh, regarding the detection of synchrotron emission, uh, as in the case of pulsar, is it necessary for the emission to be facing head-on to the detector? and can we detect if pulsar's rotation is such that emission is perpendicular to detectors and what happens if the yeah. emission passes through dust okay so there uh, these are two different questions yeah so um, uh, let's uh, start with the first one that is uh, whether you can uh, detect emission which is not pointed towards the detector no we only see radiation from any object in the sky only if the radiation is pointed towards us and the, the radiation hits the detector if from the source the radiation is pointed in another direction it might uh, not come to the detector definitely and it will might not come to the earth at all it will go somewhere else so how are we going to detect it so only radiation that we detect is when the radiation is traveling from the source to the detector so uh, that is the first uh, uh, part of the question and this is true for emitters which are not beamed emitters like this 
even uh, isotropic emitters, for example, the sun. The sun emits in all directions. However, it is only that part of the emission which is directed towards us is what we detect. The radiation that goes in other directions, we do not detect. What if the emission pass, passes through dust? So dust, as I uh, showed you yesterday, that has a large absorption in the range which is near to, which goes through optical a little bit, very little in infrared, but very strong in ultraviolet and extreme ultraviolet. So if the radiation passes through dust and if the radiation happens to be of those wavelengths, it will, not, it will be highly attenuated. Whereas radio emission, for example, is not affected by dust. So uh, the pulsars, for example, emit mostly in radio and they are not affected by dust and they can pass through and come to us unimpeded by dust. Next question. Yeah, next question is from Sri Raj. Uh, he is asking that how can synchrotron have both thermal and non-thermal components? I did not mention about thermal synchrotron emission actually, but uh, synchrotron is a process, a single particle process. That part, uh, single particle process does not distinguish between thermal or non-thermal uh, emission. As I've described to you, whether an emission is thermal or non-thermal is decided by what is the energy distribution of particles. A single particle when producing synchrotron emission, all the particles in the energy distribution may be individually producing synchrotron emission. But if the particles the, have their energies distributed such that that can be described by a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, then what you will get from this collection of particles is a thermal synchrotron emission. Because the energy distribution of underlying particles is thermal can be described by Maxwell Boltzmann. On the other hand, a distribution like this is not Maxwell Boltzmann. If the energy distribution, gamma is energy, basically gamma mc squared is energy. So gamma is energy. So the energy distribution is a power law like this, then it is not described by a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. And th so therefore, any emission, uh, either a synchrotron or any other process generated by particle distribution like this, will be called non-thermal non -thermal synchrotron or non-thermal emission, even if it is Bremsstrahlung. If the you know, particle energy distribution is like this, you will get non-thermal Bremsstrahlung. So you know, the single particle you know, mechanism of emission and the you know, non-thermal or thermal description of the spectrum, you know, they are two different things. You can get non-thermal or thermal for any specific uh, single particle mechanism. It just depends on the energy distribution of the particles that emit. Is there any other question? Uh, there's one more question by Chetna. Uh, is cyclotron line, emission line always Gaussian? If it is asymmetric, then is it due to presence of harmonics or some other reason? I think this is not a question that follows from the lecture directly. Uh, cyclotron line emission is never Gaussian. Uh, it can become Gaussian if it comes from a um, emitting plasma, which is uh, has a pure uh, Gaussian radial velocity profile, then uh, it can become Gaussian, but typically that Gaussian will also be convolved with the uh, uh, with the Lorentzian function, Lorentzian type function, which is the line profile. So uh, what we'll get is close to actually white profile and not a uh, uh, Gaussian profile. Gaussian is used as an approximation in many, in many fits, but the true line profile is in fact never Gaussian. I think that's it from the 
Okay, so then I will uh, go to YouTube questions. Yeah. The uh, whole bunch of questions which have been selected. So let's. Okay, question number one, I think I have answered. So therefore, uh, I will uh, uh, skip that. Question number two uh, by Aparna Nila. Why th uh, does there exist inverse proportional relationship between frequency and intensity in case of non thermal radiation? Not exactly inverse proportional between frequency and intensity. As I said, it is in a, in a, in a, it's a log log plot. So this is log intensity versus log frequency. And the uh, uh, law here is intensity proportional to frequency to the power of minus P minus one by two, right? It is a power law. And this power law occurs because the energy distribution itself is a power law. So uh, why is there less radiation at higher frequency? That's because in the energy distribution power, distribution of particles, there are smaller number of particles at higher energy. Higher in, uh, energy particles produce higher frequency radiation. So if you have smaller number of particles, then you have less amount of radiation at high, higher frequency. So that's the reason why uh, you have a um, declining um, spectrum as you go to a higher frequency. The following questions are answered in chat, so I'm not going to answer this. So there are no other selected questions. So that's it. Uh, there is no other question in the list. We can then stop today. Yes, we can stop for today. Thanks.